Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this special program. I know that many of you know me best as a, a fiction writer, but a lot of nonfiction study and research informs all of the work that I do uh, in my Hanukkah Bauer novels and my Chloe Ellison novels and many of my children's books. So I'm very glad that you decided to join me for this program. On a breezy, salt-scented day in the 19th century, a group of Bohemian immigrants with tear-stained cheeks leaned over the railing of the ship that would take them to America. Someone began to sing an old folk song, Where is my home? Husky voice, the others joined in as their last glimpse of Europe faded into the horizon behind them. Another day, an Irish boy with haunted eyes and hollow cheeks boarded a ship. He did not look back at the land that was so desperately ravaged by potato blight. Pinned inside his pocket was a small note that his mother had written on a scrap of paper before she died. The name of an unknown uncle and a single compass word, Wisconsin. At a different dock, several German women gave the tail ends of fat balls of homespun yarn to their weeping shawl-wrapped mothers and sisters. When the ship left her moorings, the yarn unspooled and each woman felt her twisted filament slip away, the last ephemeral link to everything dear and familiar. And sometime later, a Swedish tenant farmer, deep in debt, slipped from home on a dark night and made his way to the nearest port. He left his family with nothing but a promise to send passage money when he could, if he could. Where is my home? That question haunted thousands of Europeans a century ago. Between 1836 and 1850, Wisconsin's population rose from 11,000 to over 305,000 people. Behind the statistics were more than 294,000 unique people, each with his or her own hopes and heartaches, each with his or her own story. A Sailor's Year tells stories about European and Yankee immigrants who made their journey in the 19th century and early 20th centuries, people dreaming of, searching for, and creating a new home in a new land. And although the book focuses primarily on the experience of Wisconsin's many immigrants, it also reflects the broader heritage of the upper Midwest and the United States. It's difficult for us to even imagine how daunting the journey must have been for early European immigrants. Many knew that they were likely leaving their homeland and loved ones forever. The stereotypical view is that men were keen to travel while their wives were constantly looking over their shoulders. But that was not always the case. Johann Schuster of Bavaria succumbed to gnawing doubts the night before his departure. We know how things are, he, re he cried. Germany we know, America is an unknown country to us. His wife replied kindly but firmly, Johan, we leave tomorrow for America. Surviving the ocean crossing was only the first part of the journey. Newcomers traveled on canal boats, sloops, or steamships, in rattling train cars, or plodding wagon. Once reaching Wisconsin, a few of the new arrivals settled in Milwaukee, Green Bay, or other port cities. But most moved on to explore the prairie and woodland landscapes. In 1850, less than 10% of the state's population were urban dwellers. Also traveling from the Eastern seaboard were Yankees, men and women of English descent, many third or fourth generation Americans, perhaps restless, perhaps adventurous, 
perhaps already feeling confined by the growing population, perhaps frustrated by rising land prices. These people also left friends and family in Maine and Vermont and New York to try their luck on the Western frontier. They brought a zeal for civic improvements and a dedication to a democratic government. Although far fewer in number, free Blacks traveled from Eastern cities in search of a home as well. Other African-Americans fled slavery and found sanctuary in the remote hills of southwestern Wisconsin. All of those dreaming of agricultural opportunities were not the first to arrive, of course. Early French explorers and traders had met the area's Native American groups without displacing them. The tragic clash between U.S. government land policy and the Indians' way of life climaxed in the 1832 Black Hawk War. With most Native people pushed from their homes, the new pioneers found land available. The earliest immigrants to arrive encouraged others back home to follow with letters and sometimes even recruitment trips back to their old village. And Wisconsin, like some other states, encouraged settlement as well. In 1862, the Homestead Act brought more settlers to the upper Midwest with the promise of 150 acres of public land in exchange for five years of continuous residency and certain developments. In Wisconsin, over 3 million acres were claimed by almost 30,000 homesteaders. Now, in the early years, immigrants might arrive in July when there was still time to look for shelter and land, but when hot weather, crowded conditions, and malnutrition often contributed to devastating epidemics. Others found that sulky Atlantic winds or storms or other challenges delayed their arrival, sometimes for weeks or even months. It was at the 26th of November, 1835, that I first set foot in Wisconsin, wrote Isaac T. Smith. The weather was extremely cold with one foot of snow upon the ground. I was in company with some families consisting of women and small children, some of the latter, but a few months old. Whether bartered from a speculator in 1842, obtained from the government 20 years later, or purchased from a Northern Lumber Company several decades after that, the newcomers wanted land of their own. A settler's year, pioneer life through the seasons, is organized to help readers imagine the cycles most immigrants faced. All of the photographs in this stunningly beautiful book uh, were taken at Old World, Wisconsin, the nation's largest museum of outdoor rural life. Unless otherwise noted, the images were taken by a beloved colleague, Lloyd Heath. The photo essays depict the agricultural year. As I worked on this project, though, I realized that the agricultural year also uh, becomes sort of a metaphor for the immigration cycle that many immigrants experience, beginning with the sometimes brutal conditions experienced by the very earliest arrivals. I'd like to give you a taste of some of these seasonal cycles as depicted in the book. In the earliest years of settlement, spring was a time when provisions ran low and harvest was still months ago away and so it was only a promise of better times. As frost left the soil, men attacked it with heavy grub hose. Women planted potatoes and corn between the roots of trees girdled and dying slowly in what would one day become fields. When they could afford it, and this sometimes took several years, immigrants bought oxen and scouring plows designed to attack the prairie's deep, dense mat of long roots. 
Neighbors work cooperatively, sometimes hitching five or six teams together to pull one plow. People also planted gardens as they had done in their former homes. I have sown flower seed, dear father, and am looking forward to the flowers like a child, wrote Sophie Seifard in 1856. We even started an asparagus bed. So we are introducing German vegetables little by little, while the American lives on cake, meat, and potatoes all year round. Another German wrote, the Americans leave their cattle out in the open summer and winter so that the milk is often frozen in the udder. I could not bring myself to do that, so the cattle barn was the first structure to be erected. Echo the third, Americans must come to appreciate fertilization, crop rotation, and remaining in one location. I'm not sure that those assessments were entirely fair, but it is true that Yankee settlers did have a very different approach in general to agriculture. They tended to be, to be more quick to adopt mechanical innovations and were more likely to consider short-term profits. They had grown up in a place where there was always the idea that land was available to the West, to the West, and they could always move on if things didn't go well. Europeans had struggled to, to find even subsistence in many parts of the old world. They had sacrificed so much to get where they were in Wisconsin that they wanted to create a farm that could be passed down through generations. And they tended their fields and their livestock accordingly. With sunshine warming their shoulders, immigrants began or continued the work of creating their new homes. It took courage to plant a settlement, noted one descendant, but with tiny seeds and breaking plows and red geraniums, the settlers faced that challenge. They dreamed of abundance despite quivering muscles and homesick hearts. When spring softened the landscape, all things seemed possible. When summer came, all farmers eyed the sky, hoping for just enough rain, no more. Women checked garden plots both for tender new growth and also for the first sign of any garden pest. Crop success now depended largely on forces of nature beyond their control. Grains were of vital importance. What would we not give for our ordinary barley groats and cut barley when early immigrant lamented? The Americans do not know how to grind grain and our Swedish stomachs sigh in vain for our beloved porridge. Most European farmers planted rye and oats for home use, but long before the dairy industry emerged, wheat was literally the golden crop. Thousands of prairie acres were plowed under and sown with wheat. In the early days of hand tools, the best gleaners could cut perhaps four acres a day, but that took practice. When I first began to cradle wheat, I thought my ribs should break the next morning when I started in again, recalled Frederick Hanniager, a Prussian immigrant who arrived in 1854. Cut grain had to be raked and bound into bundles, shocked and stacked by hand. Women worked inside and out, including field work. One pioneer noted of a neighbor, Mrs. Nass was always a persistent worker in the fields. Her husband cradled the grain and she bound it. When she could not do her housework in the daytime because of the press of outside duties, she did it at night after supper and the chores were done. And while she was doing all this, Mrs. Nass raised 18 children. Children often attended school in the summer for it was easier to spare them from home during the hottest months rather than during planting or harvest time. 
But children learned early that everyone had chores to do on a farm. As summer's sticky heat faded, women and men took stock. Some dreams had been shattered by hail, by chinch bugs in the grain and caterpillars in the cabbage, by the limits of even a strong man's ability or a hardy woman's determination. But other dreams literally bore fruit as evidenced by wash tubs of beans and crocks of pickled cucumbers and barns filled to the rafters. My th farm is thriving, John Curler wrote home in 1852. In addition to God's blessings, our work has not been in vain. In the early years of settlement, families worked through the fall to thresh wheat and rye and oats. Men without barn floors thread sheets or canvas tarps and circled bundles of grain placed on the threshing floor, beating kernels free with flails. And you can see the farmer here is holding a flail. It's a, a wooden staff uh, with a leather loop connecting it to another shorter wooden piece. And that's how the grain was beaten from the stalks. Other men drove oxen in endless rounds to trample the kernel free. And of course, all of those kernels had to be winnowed to free it of chaff and dirt and dust. Without transportation, obtaining supplies was a challenge. One young Belgian woman left home long before dawn with a 60 pound sack of wheat on her back and made a 15 hour, 30 mile trudge to the nearest mill. After sleeping at the mill, she returned home the next day with the precious flour. Her son wrote, it was considered a vacation of sort. It was a change of motion. However, other Belgian women who made such trips uh, struggled not just with the long march, uh, but also the fear of getting lost or encountering a wolf in the woods. Harvest suppers were only one of the late season's diversions. Settlers were generally quick to help with, help their neighbors with big jobs like butchering, but with the anxious frenzy of harvest past, many gatherings started to take on a distinctly social element. Life was not easy, recalled one woman, but we always had time for old fashioned country pleasures. We used to take our work and go and spend all day with a neighbor and real sociable times we had. Children helped empty gardens, gathering vegetables that grew above ground before moving on to root crops. The vines twining among corn stalks sometimes bore magnificent pumpkins and squash. Our pumpkins grow to weigh as much as 30 pounds, one immigrant marveled. My wife could not take two of them in at the same time. She could only come in with one. They are very value, valuable to make syrup out of and also for the cattle. They make much milk. Hickory smoke wafted from the smokehouse and apple butter simmered on the stove. Women counted and recounted jars and sacks and crocks of food stored in attics and root cellars, calculating meals, hoping their labors would last their family through the long winter months. Men did the same in their barns, eyeing hay and straw, bins of feed corn, barrels of the mangles and rutabagas set aside for the cow. The families had done their best and wet, ready or not, winter was upon them. During the first winter seasons, families huddled in tiny cabins. Water froze in our glasses on the table, recalled Hanukkah, Hannah Parker. And if a little spilled on the floor, it would freeze before we could wipe it up. We had no crib for the baby and had to keep him tied in a chair. Our mother was sick all winter and we hung quilts and blankets around the stove pipe and fixed her bed inside the enclosure. Women hung rag rugs over empty door frames and tacked squares of grease muslin over glassless windows. But when temperatures plunged far below zero, it was impossible to maintain heat. 
Not all the people in the house could find a place around the stove at the same time, wrote a Norwegian man. And the ones who got there first enjoyed rights of priority. We almost perished from cold, both outdoors and in, during the bitter winter days. A Yankee immigrant remembered another harsh reality for early settlers. Only those who've experienced it can imagine the loneliness of the first winter 30 miles from the nearest post office. One inconvenience was the lack of matches. One wild, windy night, Mr. Garner's fireplace went out. Soon Mr. Salisbury came. He, too, had lost his fire. Together, they started for Mr. Smith's house to borrow coals. Mr. Salisbury fell into a river when crossing on a fallen tree. While Mr. Salisbury remained at Smith's to dry his clothing, Mr. Gardner started homeward. After going some distance, he thought his pail felt light and he realized that the bottom had melted and he had lost all of his ashes. Returning, he borrowed an iron kettle, filled it with coals and finally succeeded in making his way home with it. Even in the most brutal cold, one crop beckoned, timber. One Danish woman remembered, soon it was winter and not having any money, my husband and I had to work again. We helped each other to make cordwood for which we said we received 60 cents a cord. We had to wade through snow knee deep and yet had to work every day the weather permitted it. It was necessary to survive. Another account told of a woman who shouldered an ax like all women did in those days and went into the woods with her young husband, helping him fell trees and saw logs. She wore men's heavy boots and often the ax would glance off while she was cutting wood and cut into her boots. She and her sister-in-law also felled trees unassisted by help for several winters. Despite the grueling labor, many women took satisfaction in their accomplishments and contributions and relished being outdoors. As communities were established, winter did not keep people indoors, including children heading for school. We used to get pretty cold on winter mornings, wandering through deep snow with the temperature 20 or 30 degrees below zero, a woman named Angela Favell re remembered. And young adults cherished sleigh rides. One man recalled the crack of the driver's whip as the horses started off, the jingle of bells, the sharp, crisp winter air, the joyful songs and bandying of jokes. Usually you went to some town 15 or 20 miles away. You rode all evening and probably reached the end by 1 a.m. Then came oyster stew. You sat around the stove telling stories, singing songs and cracking jokes for a while. Then back home. If you were lucky and there weren't any drifts, you got home before daylight. Some immigrants used quiet evenings to write letters. Emily Moulton poured out her anguish in one. You don't know, Aunt Delinda, how anxious I am to go back to dear old Vermont and have a good visit with you all. Should we never have the pleasure of meeting again on earth, let us anticipate a joyful reunion in heaven where parting shall be known no more. For many, winter was ultimately a time to savor a slower pace, to reflect, to plan. The frenzy of autumn harvest was past. Women and men caught their breaths, pulled rocking chairs close to the fire, and waited for spring. Most settlers agreed that the first year was the hardest. Everyone that starts on this journey must consider that one may, must first taste sour before he can drink sweet, cautioned one immigrant in a letter home. The winter was especially long for newly arrived people who huddled in dugouts or crowded into tiny cabins with nothing to do but wait for spring. But spring did arrive. Counterbalancing despair was a spirit of cooperation that pervaded many rural settlements and helped 
Its pioneers survived that often brutal first year. Almost everybody needed some kind of helping out, recalled a Black woman who lived in the integrated rural community of Pleasant Ridge. Immigrants in lonely valleys watched for the next crop of newcomers, even if their own cabin was so crowded that it was impossible to walk across the floor at night. Women sought the company of other women. Even if they didn't speak the same language, a shared cup of tea and sympathetic concern provided comfort. Certainly some dreams died. A few immigrants saved money and returned to their homeland, and some did not lo live long enough to see their children thrive. However, many settlers did manage with what one man summarized as hard work, indomitable pluck, and a rigid economy to create farms and provide for their descendants. Those traits were ultimately found on thousands of farms throughout Wisconsin and the upper Midwest. There was no distinct pioneer era in the state. While the earliest Yankee settlers in Wisconsin's southeast corner were looking with pride at decades of accomplishment, later arrivals were settling their own pioneer, entering their own pioneer period on the rugged cutover land of Northern Wisconsin. German immigrant John Curler spoke for many of those who sacrificed and planned and stuck it out through hard times. Of all my former occupations, there was none that appealed to me as agriculture does. And to this, I am now devoted with my whole soul, he wrote in 1853. What I formerly often wished for in sad hours, I have found here. He and many other people from Russia and Belgium, Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, Finland and Scotland, and so many other places knew that they were, at last, home. I wanted to mention a couple of other projects that uh, emerged from the kind of research that I did as I compiled A Settler's Year. My newest book out is called Lies of Omission. It's the first uh, book of a trilogy about a Pomeranian woman from who's from Prussia, uh, northern part of what we think of now as Germany. Many of you are familiar with my Chloe Ellison series about a museum curator at Old World, Wisconsin. Uh, these books are set in uh, various locations at different historic sites and museums and feature different ethnic groups. There are 11 books now in the series and I'm working on number 12. And I also recently col collected uh, some poems together for a compilation called Balancing, Poems of the Female Immigrant Experience in the Upper Midwest, 1830 to 1930. These emerged over many years as I found very poignant tidbits uh, in various research projects that didn't make it into the final book, but sort of stayed with me and I and I wanted to share them in a more condensed form. As always, I invite you to, to stay connected. Uh, you can find me at KathleenErnst.com. I also have a blog and I'm active on Facebook. And the best way to keep up to date with new books and other programs and events is to sign up for my website or for my newsletter on my blog, KathleenErnst.com. Again, I wanna thank you so much for sharing this evening with me and happy reading. <music>